Okay. Um, I think it's the top of the hour now, so um, hopefully everyone's okay for me to just to start now. Uh, unfortunately, I can't see the matrix chat, um, but uh, hopefully people can write their questions in the shared notes section. And uh, yeah, um, let's just get started then. And uh, so I'm Philip Heron. Um, I'm the guy working on the GCC front end for Rust. Um, so it's a I'll get into showing what that is and what it's all about. There's uh, a lot of slides in here to go through. Uh, I just want to point out uh, the little Ferris crab at the top and right, uh, the right hand side where it's holding on to the, the GNU logo here. Uh, I spent probably far too much time trying to crop off the the claw and get it layered up correctly. Uh, Philip Krona has given me the idea from that <laughs> to do that one. Um, but I think it's kind of funny. It's just the idea that you know Rust is then grabbing on the GCC here. And obviously, uh, well, thanks for open source security and Embicosm as well. So let's see. Um, next slide. So in this presentation, I sort of want to go through a few things. Um, I want to sort of talk about like the motivations of it, like the what, why, and how. Um, you know, why are we working this? Why you know, what even is it? Um, what sort of caveats are there? You know. All that sort of stuff and um, what sort of progress has already made i want to sort of give me a, a little bit of a demo on how it actually works what to expect when you actually run this thing you know um what's the sort of status of it at a high level i want to talk a little bit about the the community i've been trying to develop I'll talk about you know future work um and then question and answer sort of section towards the end um and so feel free to uh, stop me even though i can't see the chat hopefully um you can click the raise hand or you know, do the webcam thing or put in share notes. I'll try and keep an eye on these things as we go on. So what is a front end? Um, I stole this like, uh, well, an old diagram I made years ago. Um, it's maybe not the best diagram, but it's just to give you a high level idea of what I'm actually working on here. So this is sort of a really high level architecture of a, a, a traditional compiler, uh, which so, so happens to relate quite okay to GCC. So you got source code coming in here, and then you got this notion of a front end, and then it's passing something over to your middle end to do optimizations to then pass those over to the, the back end to actually then generate assembly. So the piece I'm working on in here is just the front end itself. And then we're actually you know producing the generic uh, code over to the middle end, which then turns into the you know the RTL and all that sort of magic in the back end, which then gives you your assembly, you run your assembler on it, you get your object code. And you run your linker, so it's just a just traditional uh, compile um, compile pipeline that you would expect. So this is the piece I'm going to be talking about. It's just this front end piece here. And the reason I just want to show this diagram is that it, you know it's sort of it's alongside other front ends and a larger system, which you'll also be uh, familiar with. So what is this? Um, so I want to make. Um, a full implementation of Rust on top of the GNU tool chain. That's sort of a high level way to think about it. Uh, the, you know, we want to make this uh, as as robust as what you would expect from a normal C and C plus plus front end from GCC. We want it to be of the same level quality. We want it to be upstreamed, obviously. So when you get a build, or if you get a tarball of GCC, you will also get our Rust front end as well. You know, obviously, in that we are also reusing all of you know the GNU tool chain here. So that means we're getting to reuse bin utils, LD, assembler, GDB. Uh, we're also writing this in C++. So that's something maybe to talk about later on. Um, and so uh, that means it's uh, much more easily bootstrappable um, going forward. Because uh, you know, obviously GC is written in, um, in C and C++, well, C++ now. Um, and we want to we want to reuse things like the official uh, the official uh, Rust you know libcore, lib standard, um, and so on. We want to try and reuse those um, and as absolute minimal sort of changes to those as possible. Um, so that that's sort of the the idea of what this will eventually be. And you'll see a demo later on to actually show you what it's like to invoke it and so on. Um, so. Personal motivations, I think, is an important thing to talk about. So, you know, I was working on this, you know, quite a long time ago. Um, and so I really do enjoy working on big projects or something uh, really satisfying about, you know, sinking your teeth into something. It's got a lot of scope there. Um, I think, as I mentioned, um, 
I and before the talk started, I'm a really big fan of people like uh, Andreas Kling and Tim Morgan. I know there was guys on YouTube who like you know broadcasting and showing their hacking sessions on their projects. Um, I always enjoyed watching those, and even when their projects are really big. It doesn't matter. You learn so much by watching these guys and you sort of, you know, it's the community aspect of that that I really like. Um, and then a side note to that, you know, GC was always going to provide a contrast to LLVM, you know, um, in terms of, you know, code size is something uh, people talk about, like, you know, whenever uh, there's the website, uh, fromex.com, you always see them posting GC versus LLVM. So that'll be pretty interesting down the line, especially um, to see how these things compare in terms of code generation. You know, it'll be interesting to see how well GC actually handles a modern, you know, high level language like this, you know, um, although Go's there, Go does rely on a lot of runtime features. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how GC will be able to optimize this sort of something that's a bit more similar to C++ in terms of what you can do. Um, be interested to see the register allocations, you know, for all the different targets it supports and so on, the energy efficiency, there's all sorts of different features to compare and characterize at some point. Oh, I think there's already some questions coming in here. Um, what mechanism are you using to pull in the Rust libraries as it gets submodules? Um, so at the moment, we're not pulling in any uh, of uh, Rust sort of code at the moment. Um, because we're not there yet to start compiling libcore, libsand, or anything like that, obviously. Um, so I think down the line, I think it might be uh, interesting to try Git submodules, but I've had mixed um, mixed success with Git, Git submodules. Sometimes they work for projects, sometimes they don't. Um, I think it'll be I, it'd be nice to do it with Git submodules because but easier to track things that way but uh, we'll have to see how, how we get on at that point um it could very well be that we might end up choosing to go for a more the approach that gc go did where you actually you know, pull in a copy of the those libraries that you care about or whatever you want but um we'll figure that out down the line and the other question we have here is do you plan to use to use and pass the Rust test suite. Uh, yes, that's one of the things we really were passionate about. We want to make sure we get you know, compatibility with the uh, Rust test suite. You know, that's really important. Um, uh, one of the things that, um, in some ways, I find difficult. Uh, it's maybe a bit more easy to talk about down the line, but uh, the Rust test suite does sort of mix a lot of what it's testing in each test file. So sometimes. I, I quite like writing test files that are explicitly testing a certain thing, but that obviously means downline you also need to write tests that are you know combining these things together. But a lot of the Rust test suite does combine here. I'm using a lot of these attributes and I'm using all of this and I'm using all of that. Whereas at the moment, you know, I we can we don't have lib standard and so on, so I can't use things like transmute in my test cases yet. Um, so there's we're building up our own test suite at the same time as this. That's maybe something I'll talk about at the end about the rationale behind that. Um, so I'll probably talk a bit more about testing towards towards the end. Um, so some of the benefits to talk about, similar to uh, Antoni's uh, talk earlier, which is fantastic. Um, you know, it provides like an independent implementation of Rust that's you know separate to the Rust toolchain, so that it actually you know breaks the dependence on Rust code here. You know, the other part here is that we do get this tight integration with GCC, you know, so we get a lot of the same benefits as being in tree. We don't necessarily have to, you know, patch GCC. We can just, you know, talk directly to GCC as we see fit. Um, we that might help, you know, with Rust C bootstrapping in the future. You know, that'd be an interesting thing. You know, we can natively just support GCC plugins. You know, we're already running our test suite that, you know, runs LTO and so on because it's just a normal front end. It just acts like a normal front end, which you'll see later. Um, so there's also like a useful <clears throat> uh, link in here in the in the notes that links to a paper about you know you don't want to do LTO with mixed uh, mixed languages in terms of like oh I built this thing with Clang and I built this thing with GCC. You kind of lose LTO and CFI there. Um, so that's another motivation and benefit. You know we want to be able to provide the full GC uh, code generation experience. And so we do avoid those problems. You know, uh, we also want to, you know, drive adoption, Russ, you know, so if you're someone, some company that only 
you know, has a GNU tool chain, you know, if you then, uh, the, the, because we're tightly integrated with the GC, hopefully then you just get the Rust front end for free, uh, which might provide more backporting opportunities and so on uh, for Rust in general. Uh, one of the other things, um, it's sort of something as a future goal down the line, this is not something we're looking at right now, but uh, we bootstrapped the front end code from the GCC code, um, GCC Go code, sorry, um, which means there is actually an abstraction over GCC in there, um, which we could, we've been playing around with to get right for Rust. You know, currently, for when we started, it was very Go-centric. Like, term, for example, temporary variables were prefixed with Go temp. You know, like it's all sorts of silly things like that, and things were um, marked with decal on inlineable by default, and all sorts of stuff like that. And we want to fix this and maybe change it slash potentially get rid of it. We're not sure, but the, if we do keep this abstraction in there. One of my goals always was from the start, oh, it'd be really nice to have like an independent implementation that you could then pull out and use for like something completely crazy, like, uh, I don't know, .NET or JVM or something weird. Um, so that it's just, that you just need to provide a, a backend implementation. Though in that we are reusing things like GC's constant folder. So there's hooks in there that we want to make sure the, the target your, uh, trying to put this compiler into does give you a constant folder, for example. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and then obviously we get the other systems that GC supports, which is obviously of interest to the Rust for Linux project. Um, so how, uh, as I mentioned, the this project started back in like 2014. Um, I, the Rust was still like 0.7, 0.8 uh, around that time. Uh, I just really enjoy compilers and I've started finding Rust pretty in interesting. And I remember the first thing I wrote in Rust was like a, a Lisp interpreter that was sort of half finished. Um, and uh, I remember just thinking, um, you know, match statements are just class. I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. You know, you had to look at things like Scala and all those sorts of other JVM languages to get interesting functional things like that. Um, but having that in an actual native language just was that you just knew that having those features from the get-go in a native language was going to definitely be popular. Now, the only thing with that was back in Rust 0.7, up in 8, whenever you wanted to like allocate something on the mem, uh, if you want to put something on the heap and, or if you wanted to put it on the stack, you had to use these little modifiers like tilde and, and ampersand. And you had to like, you know, if you want things to be boxed and so on, you had to use the at symbol and there was talk about adding a garbage selector. And uh, I remember I had like a whole bunch of this sort of stuff sort of working in the compiler at one point. And then I realized I hadn't actually checked what Rust was like uh, in the course of two or three weeks. And then all of a sudden it was all gone. And that's when the whole like, you know, boxing thing started coming in. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it was pretty hard to keep up with the pace of change because it did change quite a lot back at the start. But since like um, definitely uh, I would say 2018 for me, like, uh, uh, that addition really has started to stabilize the core of the language. Um, and so I think it, since 2018, it did start to make a lot more sense. I was able to write some more uh, smaller projects in that time, uh, just in my spare time, which I really enjoyed. Uh, and so I remember uh, I really did enjoy working with compilers and I thought, well, let's start this again. Let's see what it's like. And so we started the community effort back in 2019, joined forces with another guy. Um, and so we merged our like uh, parser and AST implementation and started moving forward since then. Um, but like uh, since the recent, you know, interest in the Rust for Linux ecosystem, you know, I've been uh, contacted, you know, uh, all, um, by Brad Spengler from Open Source Security and Ebicosm to, su to support this project. And thanks to David Ellison from the GC Steering Committee for linking all this up for us. And uh, currently I'm actually working on this full time at the moment. So uh, thank you to the, everyone there for making that possible for me. Um, so currently um, I'm planning to try and get to like a minimal viable product, you know, compiler by, you know, hopefully the end of, uh, uh, next Christmas sort of thing. That's sort of where my rough estimate is trying to get us to is something that's compiling something, which basically means probably something like um, Rust without a bar checker, kind of like MRUSC, but um, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about the bar checker towards the end about that. And so, so far, 
done a bunch of different stuff. I've kind of tried to break down the project into like sort of high level features. You know, it's 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 pretty difficult to do that with Rust, I have to say. Um, you know, so core data structures, that was all about like, oh, can you actually um have do you have primitive types? Can you compile like an integer and do some basic math on them? Uh control flow one was all about like, oh, can you actually, you know, call a function and take the result of it and all that sort of stuff. And then generics, you know, actually having generic structs and uh, generic functions and generic impl blocks and all the different associated things there, because you can actually do traits if until you have generics done first. Um, so I've done sort of core trait uh, resolutions sort of been working. And now we're on to control flow two, which sort of is going to tidy up an awful lot in the compiler at the minute. So um, control flow two is all about, oh, we want to get closures sort of working. We want to start looking at, you know, um, uh, pattern matching a little bit. We want to fix up some of the bits and pieces of um, where constraints and bits and pieces around that, um, which will bring us towards the end of the year. Uh, but then obviously macros and config expansions, they haven't been started yet. Imports and visibility hasn't been started yet. There's all sorts of unstable features we haven't looked at yet, mostly around um, uh, const generics and there's generic associated types are becoming up and I think I remember reading somewhere that I could be wrong with this, but like the box keyword might be getting removed or something like that. I might be wrong there. Uh, intrinsics and built-ins and so on. Um, so they're not really started, but that's maybe not fully true. The The community has actually started an awful lot of these things. So some of this is all sort of started. Um, and so that's kind of nice to see that, uh, uh, that maybe there's, uh, the community might be able to help me out here a lot. Um, so yeah, let me just give you like a quick run through of what this actually looks like. What do you, what will you actually um, get at the end of this? Um, so I'm not sure if you can see my screen yet. I'm not sure what's the best way to figure this out. If you can see my screen. Um, is it viewable? Yep, we can do okay. it. Okay. All good. Awesome. Um, so I've just got a couple examples here. I just want to give you an idea of what this looks like. Um, so let's just do the classic hello world. So as I mentioned, we don't have um, uh, a macro expansion and we don't compile a standard library yet. So this is literally, oh, here's an unsafe block to call printf. Um, so what does it actually look like? You know, Rust C, you do Rust C uh, minus G, whatever. Um, but uh, GC Rust, you don't. Uh, Compile it as if it's like a normal GC program. So I've got the compiler, manage G for debug symbols. I'll turn off um, debug because it's kind of a lot of the examples are kind of toy examples I'm going to show you. Um, but uh, they're, they're up, a lot of the optimizations are actually working now, which is nice. Um, if I then compile hello and give it an output of hello. Um, and so then I can run hello. So we get hello world one, two, three. Um, so that was satisfying. Um, there's a slight caveat in the GC version here is that actually the null terminator string is not really being used at the minute because if you don't specify that, it actually works because I'm using like a GC build string at the minute, which is automatically already adding the null terminator. I, we know we have to fix that, but it's just not really a huge priority right now. But I'm trying to just use it for now just to show that uh, it is being respected because there was a bug in our lecture that actually if you use an null terminator string, it was just being stripped out for a while. Um, but anyway. There's Hello World working. Um, that's a kind of just a nice, simple thing to show. One of the things, it took a long time to actually get to Hello World um, because we only were able to get to Hello World because you need to be able to compile an extern block to say, oh, there is an extern function with this ABI and it has this um, these, uh, these types, like it's got a pointer and it's a radic function. Um, so that means you need to be able to call a function. You need to be able to handle extern blocks, but the more complicated the piece is actually this unsafe part. So uh, we do have support for unsafe blocks, but the bit here uh, where Rust, whenever you uh, you know assign uh, a value uh, of a string, it's you know str, but actually to pass it over to a uh, um, some C code, you need to be able to do some casting here. So this sort of relies on having coercion sites at the assignment operator. It also then relies on casting with the as operator here. So there's sort of really subtle things going on here to actually be able to 
let you compile this in a sensible way without having to rewrite your type system again. So that's that's been the reoccurring theme with actually writing a front end is that so many of the features are interconnected. And so it's very, very important to find the right order in which you actually build up your features. Um, so uh, that's uh, it's been actually really interesting. And as I'll show you after this demo, um, some of the things I'm doing around that. Um, so the other interesting example might be something like uh, uh, qualified type is something I've been working with recently over traits. So um, I know there's a lot of unsafe here, but this is an important test case. It's actually from the Rust Nomicon that I've adapted that, you know, if you're using qualified paths, it's then bringing you to the correct, you know, trait function and so on here. Um, so we can compile all of that as we'd expect. It's the same thing again. Um, roll with optimizations if we want. Um, wrong file. So, uh, that's the correct result. Just have to take my word for that one. But <laughs> but the interesting bit in this uh, in this example is that um, the point of qualified paths was that oh I've given an input block with a function f, but I've also got two traits with a function f, and so you are actually able to differentiate between these using the qualified syntax because if you just use a normal path, it will then default to the implementation which overrides, you know. Um, but yeah, so that's some of the interesting things we've done around traits. Um, another thing we've been really it's really important to this project is error handling. Um, so this is just a really example, a, a basic example here, but a bad type error. So for example here, I've got A as a Boolean here, but actually we're gonna pass this Boolean to this function called test. So um, the, you should see an error here basically. Um, so yeah, expected an integer got a Boolean. And so we can see here with the rich locations, you know, we can see this is the, the Boolean here and we expect it to get an integer because of this. Um, so we are working quite hard to try and get decent error messages, uh, which is really important. Um, and for example, the next error message we're gonna show you is um, is an example of why, why it's so important. So there's, um, if I look at this, uh, this example, uh, if you have a generic structure, but you have an input, two input blocks here, um, you have one that implements it for I size, one for F32, for example. Um, if you're actually then using a path here, it's impossible for the compiler to differentiate which function test here is the correct one, because what happens here is the compiler is going to use the inference variable to try and figure out which one, but there's not enough information to differentiate with them. So um, for example, the error you get here is um, multiple candidate error. Um, so you have multiple applicable items for this scope. The reason that um, I do draw um, why these are important is that I do use um, error messages to try and figure out if I'm, if we're tackling the particular features in the language correctly, because if I can't, if the compiler can't um, detect a particular error condition, it probably most likely means there's a bug in our implementation. Um, so to be honest, most of the time when I'm going through the Rust test suite, I'm looking for error test cases. Um, and so there is a, a lot there to go through. Um, and so it, it helps make sure that I feel sort of confident that we're on the right track. Uh, obviously in this example, it's a little bit noisy. Uh, so you can see this is the actual error, but then we keep propagating the error. Um, so uh, there's some tidy up there to do obviously, um, but uh, that's something that happens over time. Uh, a lot of these are just sort of catch-alls whenever we, uh, uh, when we're going over the intermediate representations, we wanna make sure is this thing actually being called for this particular expression and so on. Um, something a bit more interesting would be like, um, uh, we've got like basic debug support. So, um, it seems to be working pretty good. Uh, so I'll show you what looks like debugging through this code. Um, so I can start it go next You can print what object is and we get low here. It's a nested struct and it's printing it all out for us, you know, um, and so we can keep going as, you know, and it'll show you like nice little bits and pieces here um, of what things look like. Uh, I suppose I, I should say thanks to the communities really helped me figure out how to get um, debug support right because in Rust there's, there's conventions about how you generate 
the uh, debug support correctly. <clears throat> Turns out if you've got like a tuple, um, like the fields with a tuple are meant to be like prefixed with two underscores and things like that to get the proper debug support. So there's sort of little caveats in there to like figure out the right way to get this stuff um, done basically. Um, the other thing that's worth showing if hopefully this doesn't go crazy here. Um, I try to be uh, really open about like how I'm tackling this project. So one of the things I did was make this sort of spreadsheet and I sort of went through the Rust like book to try and like uh, take out all these like high level features and try and say, try and figure out the best way, like where are we in this um, and sort of track it this way. Uh, I, it was difficult to set up at the start, but I think it's been worthwhile um, to try and figure out where we are. But the other thing is, I keep this like uh, reporting repository open on GitHub. So uh, we uh, keep um, a weekly report and a monthly report. So it keeps track of everything that we're doing. And I like to go into detail about uh, what the contributors are doing. I really do like to big up like what work each, every person is doing. And I like to show uh, examples and talk about the examples uh, about how they work and so on. So, um, no, I've got multiple tabs of that open. So a report might look like this. So we've got um, some sort of all DREF working. So we're finally able to do methods with, you know, without having to have the exact type, you know, the compiler will inject the reference and so on. Um, there is also, we fixed up some of the debug support. So we give links to like Compiler Explorer, whenever the Rust for Linux project give this example for Rust for, um, for uh, for the different compilers, there was a bug here that we weren't actually getting this um, optimized correctly. So now we are getting it optimized, so it will detect this, you know. Um, and I like to be able to describe, you know, um, show where are we with the issues, how many issues have been created, how many test cases have we added, um, how many bugs have been found, how many bugs have been fixed, what sort of percentage are we going through, any risks and so on. Um, and so uh, that's kind of a rough overview of um, how the project uh, looks like at the minute. So we'll stop sharing. Um, the uh, another question I get after that is this uh, compiler pipeline in the work. This um, this uh, diagram's a little bit out of date. Uh, there's, there's some extra steps in here, obviously, but the overall idea is like, oh, there's a lexer, there's a partial, we get an AST, and uh, we have a macro expansion pass, but it doesn't really do anything. There's um, there's hooks in there though that we actually at there's see micro expansion config expansion are two separate things but it's represented as one thing here um, so it's not quite right we've got aim resolution we've got HR lowering we've got type resolution and then we've got um, our generic backend which is a terrible name but that's us you know generating the GCC code and then we give it to GCC so we aren't doing MAR because I think MAR looks a lot like um, GCC's generic in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, this kind of rough overview of what it sort of looks like. And we'll talk a little bit about the community. Um, so one of our contributors, Mark, uh, he sent us this lovely picture. He's got his custom keyboard project here. He's got a little Ferris and I, uh, for all the contributors, I've actually sent out a, a little mug to say thank you, saying compilers are hard and they most definitely are hard, but they're pretty satisfying. And it's also holding on to the wee a GNU logo. Um, and so the goal here is we want to make working on compilers fun. Um, obviously, I mentioned earlier, we've done status reporting. And I want to shout out to all the contributors every time I do that and be as open and transparent. And one of the things we do have is this monthly community call. It's on the first Friday of the month. It's kind of a good time for me because <laughs> that's 10 AM for me at the moment. Um, but I think we might be looking at either doing a second call or moving the call to maybe if there was people from different time zones looking to join. Um, but most of our contributors are within Europe at the moment. So um, it's worked out okay now for so, so far. Um, and so we do that and anyone's, anyone's, um, anyone's welcome to join this. Uh, we give out the details in our status reports, um, like how to join it. There's just a Jitsi link. Um, and so you don't need to necessarily join up to our Zulip server or join our IRC or our mailing list or anything. You can just click on the Jitsi link. You can turn your camera off and just listen. Or some people like to participate and ask us questions and so on. We're also part of Google Summer Code 2021, and we had two projects that went pretty well. And um, uh, the first project was the Cargo GCRS project by Arthur. So he was actually able to then give us a, 
uh, I think it's using like the Rust C wrapper interface and with cargo to actually let us, you know, map what the expected arguments are from what, what cargo thinks the correct arguments are over to GCC arguments. So that's so the goal here is that we want to be able to provide um, the correct sort of interface that uh, that people would expect because people are most likely going to be running this project from a from a cargo perspective. So it looks like a cargo sub command. So it'll look like cargo GCRS blah and um, you know and so we get uh, all that support. Uh, the other project was a um, uh, student from China and he was also able to give us a dead code pass. So like, as I mentioned earlier, we do put a lot of effort into what our error handling looks like, but that also means, you know, one of the other great things about the Rust compiler is that it's got really good warnings. And one of the most important one of those would be the dead code pass to me. Um, and so there's, uh, he was able to provide us with uh, basically following a very similar algorithm to the Rust C one, um, which was satisfying. So you'll find all the entry points and then go through all of those to find where dead code will be. Also, to even be able to find, you know, are there fields being used or not in structs. So the other thing is like, you know, anyone's welcome to get involved in this project. Um, it is a GC project. Um, but so I want to sort of give a wee bit of a shout out to some people. There was Joel who was sort of a parser in AST, you know, and then recently, you know, Mark Wheeler was able to add support for unions, you know, uh, you know, Mark Police was able to add module support. Arthur gives support for module expansions. He's working on uh, the V0 mangling and so on. There's also Thomas, you know, who keeps us up to date with GCC and built our, our test suite with Mark. And, you know, I, I really thank all those contributors so much. There's there's been a lot more contributors than that. I've given out over 20 mugs um, at this point, and uh, I just think it's important to say that you know with this project, there's a lot of scope for people to you know make their mark on the compiler, like to actually own something or get experience if they wish. Um, and uh, I want to make it as fun and as enjoyable as possible. Um, so we keep a list of like, you know, good first PRs and so on. Um, and, you know, so we do offer some sort of mentorship there and we try to give good guides. So we like sort of list like, you know, and tasks and so on that the, that task would break down into. And we get a lot of really good support from, uh, from Philip Crones and Bjorn here. Like they uh, help us figure out some of the nuances with um, Rust in general. Um, sometimes it's hard to figure out all of these bits and pieces with Rust and it really, not all contributions have to be code, especially um, when you're trying to figure it like, oh, Rust is actually doing a move here or, you know, the, how does this qualify, like recently uh, trying to figure out qualified paths was kind of difficult, um, you know, so it, it is uh, really nice that um, people do join and offer us help that way. Um, also, it's really, we are in Compiler Explorer as is shown, and so feel free to you know, give us test cases of bug reports. Uh, there's going to be plenty of bug reports to, to raise, obviously. We're in an early phase, but I think finding the bugs early is useful. Um, and so uh, future work. So one of the things we haven't on the roadmap at all, this at all, is a uh, borrow checker. Uh, but my, I personally think the best scenario would be for us to start looking and working with the Polonius project. Um, because that would give us maximum compatibility with the borrow checker. Um, and it is such a core piece of the Rust ecosystem is getting that right. So I think in definitely in the short to medium term, we have to be looking at working with the Polonius project. Um, I don't know if there's much appetite to rewrite a borrow checker in C++. Um, but yeah, that's uh, it's definitely off in the distance for me right now to even think about. Um, it doesn't, that's, the bar checker doesn't really drive anything to do with code generation so far as I find, um, you know, um, the drop trait, you know, it's kind of, you can figure that out without requiring a borrow checker. One of the things we haven't done is incremental compilation as well, you know, like the, the Rust tool chain, it works by like, um, uh, everything in the create is a single compilation unit. So whenever you have a mod keyword that has to load that file. So that means, you know, your actual compilation unit is actually encompassed of many files. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, we were interested in, you know, potentially with this abstraction, trying it out with other compiler infrastructures. That's definitely way down the line. We're not, you know, there's no point even trying that until we get it working with GCC first. Um, but it's something I find interesting at the start of when working on this project. Um, 
And the other thing is we do really think it's really important to drive compatibility. So we are seeking to potentially, you know, create like a, a testing project there. Uh, we do want to try and reuse the Rust C test suite. Uh, one of the issues, potential issues there is that, you know, the the GC code is a GPL project, but the uh, Rust uh, test suite is like, you know, MIT or something. I can't then just copy the test suite into GCC code and pretend it's ours, you know, so. Uh, it'd be nice to have like a separate project that will actually have some sort of driver to then invoke those test cases dependent on the compiler you want because at the minute um, our test suite is using Dejiganu, whereas the Rusty test suite is a different thing. I'm, I don't know what it uses under the hood, but it would be nice if we could actually just run the test suite as we would expect um, down the line because um, at the minute we're sort of cherry picking test cases um, to actually test our code against. Um, then the other thing would be, I'll be interested in that down the line to backport the front end because we have built this front end based off some uh, GC co code, like which was built like uh, as a GC five or something like that. You know, there's a lot of scope to backport this. So if we keep the abstraction in a certain way, in theory, it shouldn't be that painful. Um, but that's one of those things. It's like, oh, it's a one line change, but really it turns into months of work. Um, but yeah. Um, oh, there's some questions I think coming in. Um, to what extent could you reuse Rust libraries within the front end? For instance, since you've shown the traits are one of the largest blocking gaps, could you pull in chalk library, which implements the Rust trait system, increasing parts of the compiler being modularized to reuse Rust? So that that's definitely been posed quite a few times to us at the start. Um, one of the issues I have with that is that I personally think it's a um, better solution for the long term if we can break the dependence on the Rust tool chain. I think having a separate bar, uh, separate implementation really helps with that. And potentially maybe down the line after the, the, the chain has been broken, then you could start doing something like that. Um, I, I'm just not sure what only the only benefit it brings to me is oh it sort of might reduce some work but at the same time it's not really helping with bootstrapping or getting it onto different platforms because you're then still limited to the platforms Rusty supports. Um, I kind of think it's better to break the dependence. Um, if you have to say how easy it is to add support for our architectures, yeah. So one of the things because we um, are reusing a lot of. Uh, uh, GCC stuff here. We are already uh, working on many different target platforms. Um, and so it, we do actually, thanks to Mark's uh, build farm, we are actually uh, testing that regularly, um, which is nice to see. And there's um, there's been a, a Debian a developer, uh, John Paul Adrian Glaubitz. He's been uh, really interested in uh, MIPS and so on. Um, so that's been pretty cool. We the actual uh, act of you know testing the compiler in these different platforms has uh, actually uh, rattled out some interesting bugs as well. So, for instance, like float sixty fours just didn't really seem to work at all uh, until we got some patches through there. Um, and but yeah, so it's been pretty useful uh, to test it on these different platforms. Um, a lot of what the language in Rust is. A lot of what looks like the language in Rust is part of the standard library, some what like Java. How good Rust can be at a GC front end without tight integration, without a standard library? How does it work with tight cargo integration? I'm not quite sure I understand what the question is here. Good. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out what the question is of that one. For an end user, Rusty is not there. Do you mean like, oh, cargo support? To... Yes. Let me, 
maybe um, some of those who are typing questions can um, just basically ask them verbally and um, turn the camera on as well if they're having troubles. End user, let's see, is not there. Users use cargo and stuff, so it's a bit odd without all the stuff. So uh, I think um, trying to answer that question, uh, do you mean like we don't have the standard library or something? Well, the goal here is that we will be reusing the standard library. It will be a GC Rust built standard library, libcore, liballoc, and so on. That would be the goal here. And we want to minimize the incompatibilities that could arise out of that. Um, as, yeah, so I, I don't really think, uh, and obviously we have the, thanks to Arthur's Google Summer Code, we have the cargo support now at the minute. You know, we've been trying to address these questions early um, to try and gain as much, um, uh, trying to get ahead of those potential problems. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not, though. Um, but uh, a special thanks you know, to Brad Spangler and Jerry Bennett and David Ellison because you know they've been really helping me navigate this project in general. Um, you know, uh, Brad and Jeremy are sponsoring my work here, and I get a lot of mentorship from David to figure out how to actually go about this project. You know, being a maintainer like this is uh, is new to me, and I I really do enjoy working on this project and. I'm hoping I'm making it enjoyable for the community so far. Um, so yeah, questions. Here's all the relevant links, by the way, for like if you want to figure out uh, where everything is. And we have a mailing list as well. And we're on IRC and Zulu and everything. Oh, hi, Miguel. Hey, Philip. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, Thank you. Well, I was going to make you the same question that I made uh, to Anthony in the previous talk, which is uh, just in case you have some, uh, some input there. Uh, so basically, as you know, in the kernel, we use binding to generate the bindings to parse the C code and generate the, the equivalent to the C headers uh, for us. Right? Yeah. Um, but that uses lift run, which poses a problem because, of course, with GCC, you, it could be the case, for example, in particular, if you are using a plugin in GCC that randomizes, for example, the, the, the layout of a structure, for example, then the ABI wouldn't be compatible. So do you think or do you are, are you planning to perhaps work on that perhaps as a private project or somebody else uh, to add support for binding uh, to, to for running uh, sorry support to, to binding as a so using this as a backend for binding uh, i know that yeah. as uh, david uh, was telling us uh, one hour ago it's not possible easily with gcc to get mm. into the middle of the, no, <laughs> of the see. Of the user, yeah. I have uh, some experience with that actually because um, I did Google Summer Code like in 2010 and 2011 and so on. One, one of the years I did it with um, the Python Foundation. So I actually worked on Scython at one point. And so the, the project there was actually trying to write a Python plugin to then generate all the, what, what Scython calls PXD declarations, a similar, similar idea. Um, and one of the things there is it worked actually pretty good. The, one of the problems was actually getting the information from um, uh, preprocessor macros, you couldn't access those because they're all sort of encapsulated then into the uh, IR. Um, but the overall problem that really stalled the project from being useful was that if you use this, you could pile this plug plugin and run it, but at different subsequent GC versions, the behavior was completely different. Um, and so that made it kind of difficult. Um, but as far as I know, a lot of that is stabilized. The right, whenever I was doing that project, GC plugins were kind of just new. And the whole uh, GC was changing quite a lot. So that was like GC 4 or 5 or something like that I was working in then. We're, we're, we're quite far away from that now. Um, I think it would be definitely re worth investigating like a plugin approach like that to get information. Um, I think. Uh, well, like it's it's an interesting thing you say there because at the minute, one of the things our front end doesn't support this doesn't this doesn't sound related but it is support it's related, <laughs> it's, uh, or doesn't support like uh, parsing like UTF-8 stuff which Rust does, um, and so at the moment in GC there's like code in the C front end there's code in the Go front end to do this but they're all separate implementations, um, you know and it would be nice to start trying to unify some of this work to actually be able to call each other's code instead of having to re-implement everything. 
like another similar problem that I had was right logging in this compiler. I've currently been using a lot of Rust debug, just printf stuff. But you know, Dave Malcolm has this awesome logger there, and I've got a patch to then extract this out. So I think some of the I think some of the problem there is that we could maybe work better at you know, making reusable parts of GCC, um, uh, which, which is what I'd be interested in doing. Um, so, and to answer your question, I think it'd be worth trying again, um, <laughs> given where we are now. But uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the things that's interesting here is that because I'm tightly integrated with the front end, uh, tightly integrated with GCC, we're actually able to then call all a bunch of stuff. So like, as far as I remember, there's a bunch of stuff for like security and V tables and all sorts of crazy stuff like this that I could potentially reuse from the G C++ front end. And so that's what I'd be interested in seeing is um, can we extract things out to make this easier for more front ends in general? Uh, I think I went a roundabout way to answer your question there, but. <laughs> yes, I understand. No, I, I mentioned this and I also asked Anthony because Basically, for any project, not just a kernel, but any project that is written in C and they want to, when they want to adopt Rust, they will run into this. Uh, like I want to generate automatically generate the binders because I don't want to write them manually, of course. And then uh, there is this possibility of uh, of issues. So I see like a, as a piece of a toolchain, so to speak. Yeah, uh, I see it as a piece of GCC. I, I could even see it as a piece of GCC. Let's say. Yeah. So we, uh, yeah. But of course, I mean, many user space projects, it works even with Liplan, it will be compatible. So it will not be any problem. So it's only special projects, I guess, but yeah. Any, any yeah. I think that's one of the benefits of Rust though. It has really good support for stuff like that. Like any other project like Scython, for example, you have to go and manually create all these things and it, it makes it so ugly if something there changes. And like Swig will get you so far, but Swig also has its own issues, <laughs> you know, but I also do quite like Swig at the same time. <laughs> Uh, th thanks a lot for, for the talk and, and your work as well. If, I hope uh, in one year, two years, three years, maybe, uh, we will be able to compile the kernel with GCC uh, with our support. We actually, um, uh, I forgot to mention, there's actually a project, is it called Blake 8 or something like that on GitHub? Uh, it's like a nice minimal Rust program. So we're hoping to be able to compile that by Christmas. Um, it oh, basically doesn't really doesn't use mean. any real like um, standard library stuff. Well, there's a couple in there, but we can extract it out, I think. So I'll be interested to see how many bugs we find. Because whenever you posted that uh, Rust for Linux uh, uh, Compiler Explorer example, there was like five or six actual bugs in there in our compiler. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there was uh, what people only noticed was that it was missing an optimization, but what I saw there was like six bugs. They're all fixed now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I think. I uh, was initially pretty nervous about being on Compiler Explorer, but it's been really worthwhile because it's yeah. better tackling these problems. Yeah, sorry if it was too early. Sorry if it was too early, <laughs> but uh, I think it was pretty nice. It's very nice to have it uh, as much as possible. And, and so <laughs> no, I think it was fun. One. <laughs> putting the, the thing up, up on Compiler Explorer. I know we will probably flood you, flood you, yeah, in English. Like, yeah, uh, that's good. That. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then people are using an anger and finding the real bugs instead of us finding it right down at the last minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Um, uh, clarification, Rust libraries. Um, I understand that you want to be able to bootstrap via GC. I'm asking, once you have some minimal level of Rust support, could you then introduce Rust code into the front end, which would then allow you to reuse Rust code? Yeah, that's definitely something um, I've considered. Um, I think we're still quite far away from doing something like that, but that's definitely, I would prefer that approach than doing it from the get-go. Um, um, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I just want to give a shout out, you know, there's um, Open Source Security Inc. Uh, we've been sponsoring a project as well as Embicosm. Um, so you can find their uh, URLs um, uh, in, in Google. Um, so, and also um, GC Steering Committee as well. Uh, if I go back a slide, you can get their links. Yes. Uh, if other companies are interested, um, um, I'm not sure if I can talk about all that yet. I think this has been um, 
we want to try and drive to create a project that other companies are interested in joining. Um, I think, um, yeah, so we want to make it sure it's a, something that solves something for the community. Um, and we want to make sure it's welcome for other people to join in and work with us as well. well there's something raised hands. How do I, um, do I have to click on that or? Yeah. Yep. If you click on that, that should do it. I can't see it when you're presenter. Sorry. I clicked on something. I don't know if that was the right thing to do. It was me. Oh, yes. Thank so you I, 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 all it was was to say that, you know, Brad and I, are not exclusive about sponsoring this project. It's a great project, but there are more people coming down the track who welcome an opportunity to be supported on that, and we'd encourage other sponsors coming forward to assist with that. So you can reach out to any of the three names on there if you if you think you might like to sponsor uh, in any way. And thanks for uh, you guys sponsoring my work. It's been it's made a, a really great year for me. You know, I do really like Rust and uh, I really like GCC. I've always wanted to work on it full time. Um, in my previous experience, I've done mostly LLVM work, but uh, yeah, um, I've always have a soft spot for working on GCC. Um, I think I've done all the questions. Um, Unless I've missed any, or yeah, I think you've done them all as well. So, on that note, I guess probably um, you know keep an eye on the chat when you're actually able to have access to it. I guess, <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you very much for a really good oh. talk. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Have a good day, everyone.